Now, I want to talk to you for a moment about something that is very dear to my heart. In view of the dire circumstances in which our country finds itself as a result of the last presidential election, I feel compelled to share with you an experience which began for me and our party nearly 40 years ago. In the early 80s, as I traveled along Route 13 in my district between Harrisburg and the Kentucky state line, I often took note of a beautiful little house sitting about a mile south of the highway on a knoll from which there was a clear, unobstructed view of the valley beyond. A valley of fertile fields, of woodlands and streams fading into the distance of the blue ridges of the Shawnee Hill Country. The house wasn't far from where I grew up. And if I happened to be passing there near the end of the day, I would often drive off the highway and up to the top of that little hill and watch the sunset behind those blue hills. I still picture the beauty of it, the vision of that valley in my mind. And then one day, I was driving that stretch of highway and I looked up toward the house on top of that little hill, and I saw the beginning of a slag pile from a nearby strip mine being formed directly across the road from that little house. And in succeeding days and months, the slag pile got larger and larger until the picture of that beautiful valley beyond, of the fields the streams, the woodlands, and now even the blue hills were gone. They were still there, but they were no longer part of the vision of the people who lived in that house. Now indulge me for a moment, if I may be allowed to draw a parallel analogy with what has happened to my beloved country and my beloved party. During the years of the Roosevelt administration, the Kennedy administration, the Johnson administration, the enduring values of America's democratic institutions and the principles of the Democrat party were one and the same. The great majority of people in America were Democrats and believed in a balanced budget with pay as you go, not borrow and spend. They believed in equal educational opportunities for all of our children. They believed in unions which built the great middle class of America. They believed in equal justice before the law. And they believed in protecting the most vulnerable among us. And based on these principles, America prospered under Democrat leadership. The great battles that we fought in the 60s, the civil rights movement, the equal rights movement for our wives and daughters, the rights of our workers to organize and demand a larger piece of the American pie. The great society of Johnson that reached out to the poor, the disabled, the disenfranchised. And yes, even the protest in the war in Vietnam spoke to a greater expansion and embracing of these democratic principles, not diminishing them. But during the 70s, a slight sense of something going wrong began to appear in the psyche of America. It began in the little country church in which I had grown up, along with the generations of sons and daughters of coal miners and small farmers, Democrats to the core. Now the whispering campaign started in churches like ours all over the country. 
Democrats can't be Christians because they don't believe in prayer in school. And they don't believe in protecting the unborn. Two absolutely false propositions. As Democrats, we did not believe in mandatory prayer in public schools because it violates the Constitution, which says we will have no state-sponsored religion, and a prescribed prayer would violate that principle. But voluntary prayer in schools by individuals or groups have always been and will always be permissible in America. And as Democrats, we believe that the protection of life does not stop at childbirth, but continues through every phase of childhood with good health care, good nutrition, and safety for our children. And we only wish that our Republican counterparts could say the same thing. Every, every phase of life is sacred. Nevertheless, the Republican propaganda machine had found a way to co-opt the evangelical movement in this country around these two issues, dividing Americans against each other. And the slag pile to obscure the vision of one America had begun in earnest. It wasn't long before the pile was added onto. The next campaign sought to convince Americans that Democrats were unpatriotic because they didn't wrap themselves in the flag. This is yet another lie dividing America. You heard John K. McCain's comments recently on the Vietnam War. He said, we were drafting kids from the poorest families in America to fight the war while the wealthy were paying doctors to find bone spurs to keep them out of service. And you know who he's talking about. Exactly right. Five deferments for this demagogue who parades around as if the military is a plaything at his disposal, saying, my generals, as if they belong to him personally. Here's the truth. It's always been the young men and women from the middle and low income families of America who have fought our wars and defended our freedom and defended our flag. And by a large majority, they have come from Democrat families. And we know that to be true. <laughs> Mr. President, don't lecture me on defending the flag. I spent three years active duty in the United States Army half of that time in Korea with the 1st Cav Infantry Division. I belong to the American Legion, the VFW, and the AMVETS, and yet I was branded as anti-American by your Republican colleagues and had to run an entire congressional campaign where the flag was the only issue. And you remember who ran that campaign against me because he was from this county. But the propaganda has worked for them. We have been branded not only as unchristian, but unpatriotic. And the slag pile grows. And the vision of our real America becomes dimmer by the day. As America became more and more unionized, our prosperity grew. At the height of our economic power, over 40% of our workforce was union. No other country stood against us economically. The middle class was being built on union wages and benefits. People could buy homes, buy cars, get a good college education for their children. Businesses made good profits, providing health care to their employees. But then, in 1981, a newly elected Ronald Reagan broke the Air Traffic Controllers Union and portrayed unions as the enemy of America. And the spiraling down of economic justice in this country had begun. Today, 
despite soaring corporate profits, one out of four corporations pay not one cent of federal taxes in America, and just 12% of our workforce is unionized, and there has been a race to the bottom on wages and benefits to the American worker. The notion that the Republican propaganda machine put forward 40 years ago that unions were destructive of America's economic progress is still in force today and it is one more load on the slag pile to intentionally obscure our people's vision of the American dream. This tax package that they're trying to push through now is nothing more than a massive transfer of wealth from the middle class to the already wealthy. These corporations did not move overseas because of high corporate taxes in America. They moved overseas because they can pay starvation wages to poor people and because they can escape any environmental responsibility for their pollution and then export their products right back into America and undercut the corporations who have tried to stay here and build products made in this country. That's what they do, and that's the truth. This tax break will only pad the pockets of the corporations who already pay no taxes in America. You heard the business roundtable three weeks ago when the chief CEOs of corporations in this country were asked the question, what will happen to the windfall profits of this tax decrease for you? They said 75% of it will go into the pockets of the investors, not to create new jobs in America. They were honest. And yet they pursue this thing as if it were the most important thing in the world. Not for the middle class, not for the lower economic classes, but for the wealthiest people of America. My fellow Democrats, do not discount the success of the slag pile. Because the master of the slag pile was elected president of the United States this past year. The, that's true. The propaganda was effective and was helped along by Russia, an adversarial country whose only purpose is to destroy democracy here and around the world. And how was this newest layer on the pile accomplished? We now know, by virtue of testimony before congressional committees, by the executives of Facebook, Twitter, and other American social media, that over 150 million Americans saw fake ads produced by Vladimir Putin's trolls running on American media, dividing Americans against each other, and pushing Donald Trump for president of this country. That's how they succeeded. They convinced enough of the American people that the Barack Obama administration was a failed administration economically and Trump would make America great again. Do you know the last time that America had a balanced budget in this country? I'll tell you, under William Jefferson Clinton, was the last time America had a balanced budget. We were not only deficits, not deficit spending, we had begun to pay down the country's debt. I was in Congress then. I know how good the economy was. Eight years later, and two devastating wars under George Bush, we were deficit spending again and racking up trillions of dollars in national debt. In January of 2008, when Barack Obama took office, we were on the edge of a great depression in this country. Banks were failing all over America. People were losing their homes by the tens of thousands. The housing market was on its back. 
Automobile dealerships were closing. The stock market had fallen from 14,000 to 6,000, and millions were losing their retirement incomes. Unemployment was pressing 10%. And when he left office, the unemployment rate was 4.6%. The stock market was over 18,000. The banking and housing industries had recovered. The automobile industry was thriving. People's 401ks had been restored and were growing. There was no talk of a potential depression, and we were respected by our allies abroad. And that's a proof of what happened under Barack Obama. But the, but the slag pile was alive and growing, completely obscuring the reality of America's progress under one of our finest presidents. And today, the deception continues. The slag pile grows even higher. Trump's admiration for Putin, his disregard of the Constitution, his dangerous and hateful rhetoric, his verbal assaults on women, his dismissal of climate change as fake science, his refusal to release his tax returns and eliminate conflicts of interest because he knows what the truth will reveal. This is the new normal. The slag pile is the new normal for the Republican Party and their leader. And so I ask you, my fellow Democrats, when it comes to defending the great principles of our party and our democracy, on the principle of equal educational opportunity for all of our children, Will you stand with Senator Menard of our party in his heroic effort to change an unequal educational system in our state? On the principle of economic justice in America, will you stand with the working men and women in our country who through their union membership seek to restore the balance between corporate profits and decent wages and benefits for their families? On the principle of equal justice before the law, Will you stand with Senator Durbin in opposing the attempt by the Trump administration to destroy the voter registration laws of America through their false claims of voter fraud just to satisfy the president's ego and to further build the pile of slag? How many millions of lives have been sacrificed in this country's history to protect this most precious of all rights the right to cast our vote, and now they want to tear it away from vulnerable people based upon a complete falsehood. And on the great principle of protecting the poorest among us, will you stand with Senator Duckworth and our Democratic congressional members in the never-ending battle to oppose with every last ounce of their strength the repeal and the replacement of President Obama's Health Care Act and prevent the loss of health care coverage for 30 million Americans who are the poorest among us. This is the most cruel layer of the slag pile yet. My fellow Democrats, this is not the time for the sunshine soldier. This is not the time for turning our heads and our hearts away from the injustice that is enveloping America. This is not a time for playing it safe. This is a time for courage, not complacency. For only through your courage, your commitment to the great principles that have sustained us, a balanced budget, equal educational opportunity for all of our children, a fair balance between profit and labor, equal justice before the law, and protecting the most vulnerable among us. Only you can tear down the slag pile that obscures the vision of our people to be a united states of America. Democracy is at stake today in America. Do not think it cannot happen here. In the 30s and 40s, Germany had the most educated, most intelligent people in the industrialized world. And they fell sway to a demagogue 
and saw their country completely destroyed. Listen to the words of Pastor Martin Niemöller who led a revolt of German Lutheran ministers against Adolf Hitler and was imprisoned in the Dachau concentration camp. He said these words. He said, first, they came for the socialist, and I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionist, but I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. And then they came for the Jews, and I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak for me. In the words of America's greatest president, we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Democrats, do not fear. Do not condone with our silence what is happening to our beloved country and our beloved party. Stand up, speak out, tear down this slag pile of deceit and dishonor and establish the true vision of America for the next generation of our children and our grandchildren. God love you. Thank you for having me.